Now, from the makers of Cold Water Irma... The room had a definite Middle Eastern atmosphere. A high ceiling, no doors, but many curved ornamental archways covered by brocade curtains. Dim lighting from behind Moorish screens and, of course, the heavy scent of incense. It could have been a setting from a very old Hollywood movie of the Arabian Nights. From behind some heavy drapes, two men moved into the room, moving lightly over the rich Persian carpets. This is it, all right, Ronnie? Yes, I think so, George. What an extraordinary setup. Quite. But you know what we always say. Once a foreigner, always a foreigner. Mm. Well, let's give the place a good going over. You search the desk. Right. There's nothing much here. God, it's very encouraging. Hey. Hey, look at this. What is it? <laughs> well, if I didn't know better, I'd say it was an Aladdin's lamp. You'd better rub it. It might be able to solve us all this work. <laughs> right. Here goes. Bring us luck, eh? <laughs> Avengers. John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. So many women say, once an OMO user, always an OMO user. Because there's just no dirt that can stand up to the cleaning power of cold water OMO. It solves Mrs. Sutherland's washing problems for her. Very dirty oil or grease marks. Yes. If you use cold water OMO, there's no trouble at all. It comes out very, very easily indeed. There's no washing problem too difficult for cold water OMO. Over one million South African housewives have proved it. Sherry Ann Field chooses Lux for her complexion. I always use Lux. I find it so very rich and creamy, and I love the perfume. Like Sherry Ann, choose Lux for your complexion. Lux, a beauty treatment as you bathe. Episode one of this story, in which John Steed and Emma Peel embark on the strange case of the fantasy game. The skies over London were dark and filled with rain clouds. A cold wind blew the fine drizzle into deserted thoroughfares and empty alleyways. It was not a night to be out, and few people were. Big Ben sonorously chimed midnight. Half a mile away, the sound floated unnoticed through the ornate Arabian apartment where the two agents, Ronnie Westcott and George Reed, recoiled in amazement from the vivid flash of light that lit up the whole room. They gasped as smoke filled one corner and out of it stepped a shadowy figure in flowing robes. As the haze cleared, both men saw the snout of a Sten gun leveled towards them. No! No! George Reed was mowed down by a hail of bullets. Ronnie Westcott, who was closer to the arched entrance, sprinted through the velvet drapes as the Sten gun swung round on him. The figure ran forward in pursuit, firing all the time. When it reached the passageway, there was no sign of Ronnie. The man paused, crouched to the ground, wiped his hand on the carpet and brought it up sticky with blood. Clearly, Ronnie was hit. The man smiled cruelly and turned back into the room, standing over the body of George Reed with great satisfaction. The rain continued to fall over London for the next two or three hours. Then the wind changed. The clouds disappeared, and by dawn it was dry and pleasant and far warmer. Across Hampstead Heath that morning came the sound of a woman's laughter. They'd been to a party which had lasted far longer than they'd anticipated. Oh, the top of the morning to you, Mrs. Peel. And a very good morning to you, Steed. If the morning's as fun as the night was, we should have a good day ahead. Right. Nothing like an early morning walk to start things off. Or finish things up. 
coffee at my place, I think. Splendid suggestion. Good. Step out there, Mrs. Beale. Step out. <laughs> A short while later, at the entrance to Steed's apartment. I'll make the coffee. And I'll... Oh. Brother, stand right across the hall. Well, up with it. Right. I'll attend to the bacon and eggs. Oh, two eggs for me, sunny side up. And I think I'd... What, what the devil's happened here? Steed looked around him. Two pictures on the walls were hanging awry. A third was knocked to the floor. A small table lay on its side, surrounded by broken glasses. You weren't expecting visitors, were you, Steed? Steed didn't reply, but moved to the kitchen to check the state of affairs there and in the other rooms. Mrs. Peel, looking around, found a mark on the wall almost hidden by the settee. The mark was blood. A stark red handprint. She knelt to examine it and a second print lower down. As she stretched out her hand... Please! Uh, oh, no. A blood-stained hand reached to Mrs. Peel's. Ronnie Westcott was lying behind the settee, his eyes staring upwards in a glazed manner. The other hand was clutched to his chest, wet with blood. Mrs. Peel? Mrs. Peel, what is it? Oh, Ronnie. Ronnie Westcott. I'll phone for a doctor. No. No, mustn't. Mustn't. Leap out. Top security. I, I'm finished. Finished anyway. No, no, no doctor. How is this been? Steed, listen carefully. George Reed, myself, we stumbled onto something big, important. Full story in, in George's rooms. Evidence. Where is George? George is dead. Dead. Who did this, Ronnie? Who was it? Jeannie. Jeannie. Jeannie? Jeannie who? Who is she? Uh, uh, honey. Beware. Steed up. I'm up. Uh. <sighs> Ronnie Wesker. One of the best undercover men in the business. Was. Steed? Steed, what did he say? Something about a woman named Jeannie. A good-looking woman. He said she was a honey. Well, call MI5, Mrs. Beale. Q Division, Colonel Robertson. Tell him what's happened. He'll arrange to have Ronnie collected quietly without any fuss. Where will you be? Well, he said there was a full report of all this in George's room. I'm going to collect it. George Reed's dead body still lay where it had fallen hours before. The tapestries at the far end of the Arabian room were parted. A powerful-looking Turkish man entered, expensively, immaculately dressed. The robed assassin led him across to where the dead man lay. Hey, Mr. Arkady, uh, this is the man, and, and this is his wallet. Mm. Mm. George Reed. Mm. You say the other one got away, Vincent? Uh, yes, but uh, he was hit. Uh, I didn't miss him. He, he can't live long. I trust not. It is a pity you allowed him to escape. The thing to do now is cover all traces. I will attend to this one. Ah, an address. The address on this card from the wallet. You will see what you can find. Yes, very well, Mr. And, uh, Vincent, whatever you find, Destroy it. George Reed, the late George Reed, lived in rooms in North London. John Steed knew where they were and drove over. But he was just a little late. The man, Vincent, got there ahead of him. He had shed his conspicuous robes and he was dressed all in black. A sinister, slight figure who moved with assurance the front door of the apartments. Working skillfully at the lock, he was soon inside. Mm, George Reed. So this is where he lived. There were two rooms, a bed-sitting room and a smaller one that Reed must have used as a study. Vincent chose the latter, moved first to the desk, pulling out the drawers, rubbing through their contents. Breaking into the locked drawer ruthlessly... 
He found a metal waste paper basket and began filling it with papers from the locked drawer. Then he moved to the filing cabinet. It was, of course, locked, but that didn't present any problems. Uh, easy. It must be in here. Mm. Ah. Yes, the file. The file marked QQF. Yes, all this must go. Vincent tipped the contents into the waste paper basket and lit a match. He watched the flames devour the papers with satisfaction. When the last one had curled into a charred brown wafer, he took a ruler from the desk and stirred the ashes. Satisfied that no one could restore the contents, he moved towards the door. It was then that John Steed entered. Vincent quickly moved into the protection of a large cupboard that stood near the door. Steed entered cautiously and was immediately aware of the smell of burning. He looked around, spotted the waste paper basket and moved over to it. Vincent, in the shadows, drew from his belt a long oriental dagger. Steed touched the waste paper basket and recoiled from the heat just as Vincent lunged forward. The knife came down, but Steed had moved sideways. The knife flipped his coat. Steed grabbed at the knife hand just in time. The two men grappled. Steed found himself staring at the stockinged mask. With a vicious twist, Vincent stabbed again, but Steed was prepared this time. The knife fell to the floor. Vincent got a better grip and tripped Steed, who fell back against the cabinet. Vincent moved in, but Steed bounced back from the cabinet, knocked Vincent sideways. Steed got a hold and with one swift movement threw Vincent over his head towards the window. The effort made Steed fall to his knees, but by the time he'd scrambled to his feet and made for the window, Vincent had picked himself up and was running down the alleyway. Steed paused, realized pursuit was impossible, and picked up the knife from the carpet. Mm. Well, this should be useful. Definitely not made in Sheffield. Steed placed the knife on the desk and inspected the filing cabinet and the waste paper basket. It was clear that Vincent had done a good job on getting rid of everything Steed was looking for. Finally, Steed moved over to the tall cupboard by the door. What the cupboard filled with dozens of jars, all marked best British honey. Well, this can't be for real. <laughs> In Steed's apartment, Mrs. Peel waited patiently. Eventually, the doorbell rang. Ah, Steed's forgotten his key. Not again. It was the postman. Morning, miss. Uh, Ready a package. Uh, just sign here, will you? Oh, right. Thank you. Thank you, miss. Mrs. Peel moved back into the room. Ronnie Westcott's body had been removed, but she still glanced with apprehension towards the spot behind the settee. She sat down on the city and studied the parcel, turning it over in her hands. On the back was a label. Mrs. Peel read, B. Bumble and Company, a gift from George Reed. Best British honey. Now, what the devil does that mean? What indeed? And with a vicious uppercut, Jimmy Anderson finishes trimming his whole hedge in just three hours, 11 minutes. <laughs> Great work, Jimmy. Do you play any other sport? Yes, dominoes. You're looking pretty cool, Jimmy. What deodorant do you use? Shield for sportsmen, of course. Why? It works. Shield for sportsmen deodorant won't stick, sting, or stain. In aerosol or roll-on, it's made to keep sportsmen cool and dry. Think what it can do for you. The cleaning power of cold water Omo gives you the superb cleanness you want from a washing powder. Listen to Mrs. Baxter of Claremont. It really is good, you know. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, really, that, that it could be so good, you know. Once an Omo user, always an Omo user. The Avengers. Listen every evening, Monday to Friday, to John Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers, brought to you by the makers of Cold Water Omos.